Battle of Belmont unfolds. Ulysses S. Grant's first battle. What makes a hero, and how does an untested leader in a fractured nation rise to face the impossible? As 1861 unfolded, the Union teetered on the edge of a catastrophic divide. With seasoned Confederate generals like Price, Polk, Hardy, and the fearless Pillow lurking in the shadows, the Mississippi River became a chessboard of ambition and suspense. Who could step up to challenge these Southern Titans? In this gripping tale, we meet a quiet yet relentless officer named Ulysses S. Grant, a man of few words but undeniable resolve. Yet why Belmont? Why a barely known Confederate outpost in the muddy bug-infested lowlands across from Columbus? As Fremont's obsession with its strategic potential grew, Grant found himself thrust into the spotlight, ready, or perhaps not, for his first major test. But Belmont's defenses were guarded by more than seasoned veterans. Enter Brigadier General M. Jeff Thompson, the Swamp Fox, who roamed the Riverlands with an uncanny ability to strike fear into Union hearts. With paranoia reaching a fever pitch, Grant's steely calm became his secret weapon. So how did a man hardly known beyond his own ranks, a former West Point graduate turned store clerk, suddenly find himself squaring off with some of the South's most formidable commanders? And what hidden twists did this murky, chaotic battlefield hold? Join us as we dive into the Battle of Belmont, a story of ambition, grit, and the birth of a legend. In the autumn of 1861, America was a nation in crisis. Just months after the cannonades at Fort Sumter, the Union was struggling to find its footing. From the smoky hills of Missouri to the vast rivers of the West, the North and South were engaged in a brutal tug of war over strategic points, railroads, and the mighty Mississippi River. If the Union could wrest control of the river, they could choke the very heart of the Confederacy. If not, the South might open supply lines and keep its dream of independence alive. The Union's Western Department, led by Major General John C. Fremont, was reeling from defeat and seeking redemption. Fremont, known by his followers as the Pathfinder, for his days as an explorer, was a controversial figure, a mix of hero and myth, tall, daring, with a restless spirit that had taken him from pioneering expeditions in the Rockies to a failed business venture in California, Fremont was the Union's gamble in the West. His wife, Jessie Benton Fremont, a formidable woman in her own right and daughter of Senator Thomas Hart Benton, had lobbied fiercely to see her husband placed in command, convinced that his boldness would reshape the Western theater. But ambition often comes with a price. Fremont's position was complicated by the Union's defeat at Wilson's Creek in August, where Brigadier General Nathaniel Lyon, a fierce anti-secessionist, had fallen in battle. His army had been battered by Confederate forces, setting Union morale tumbling down. Now Fremont was tasked with restoring faith in the Union cause in the West, but there was one problem. His department was plagued with political enemies, logistical challenges, and his own overactive imagination. Looming on the Confederate side was General Sterling Price, the former governor of Missouri and a beloved figure among pro-Southern Missourians. He'd taken command of the Missouri State Guard and was hell-bent on pushing Union forces out of Missouri entirely. Price had friends in high places and allies ready to back him up. Major General Leonidas Polk, known as the Fighting Bishop for abandoning the Episcopal pulpit to don the Confederate gray, commanded an iron grip on Kentucky's Confederate forces. A deeply religious man, Polk was unshakable in his mission to keep Union forces off the Mississippi. Though lacking in battlefield experience, he held authority over strategic positions like Columbus, Kentucky, where he'd fortified the Gibraltar of the West with heavy artillery aimed squarely at Union boats on the river. Under him were seasoned generals like William J. Hardy, an efficient tactician and author of the military manual, Rifle and Light Infantry Tactics, and Brigadier General Gideon J. Pillow, whose flair for the dramatic was matched only by his knack for stumbling into one strategic blunder after another. Together, they formed a wall of Confederate resistance that Fremont found difficult to penetrate. Then there was Ulysses S. Grant, a man at rock bottom looking for a way up. Known as Sam to his friends, Grant's life was a string of missed chances. A West Point graduate and a veteran of the Mexican-American War, he'd spent his post-war years struggling with poverty and whispers about his drinking. Despite his obvious talent, he had a shadowed past that haunted him. 
He'd tried farming, failed. He'd tried business, failed. He'd even worked in his family's leather store, barely scraping by. But Grant had something others didn't. An unshakable calm and an innate understanding of warfare. Fremont, who was desperate for a solid commander, saw potential in Grant's quiet demeanor and knack for getting things done without fuss. Recognizing that the man had grit, Fremont appointed Grant as head of the District of Southeast Missouri on August 28, 1861, with a simple mission. Clear Southeast Missouri of rebel forces and occupy Columbus, Kentucky. Grant was posted in Cape Girardeau and given a monumental task, but he embraced it. For him, it was a chance to change his stars. The battleground wasn't just limited to Missouri. Kentucky, a neutral state, was a political hotbed. Kentucky had declared neutrality early in the war, hoping to avoid the conflict, which was a delicate line to toe with Confederate sympathies strong in the South and Union loyalties solid up North. As a result, Kentucky's location at the junction of northern and southern economies, coupled with its fertile farmlands and valuable riverways, made it highly desirable real estate. However, both sides were eager to recruit men and establish positions there. To both sides, this neutral Kentucky looked more like a diamond-studded chessboard. Union and Confederate recruiters slipped in quietly, building up regiments under the guise of local protection. But by August 1861, Kentucky's legislature had shifted Unionist, creating a window for the Union to move more openly and organize in the state. In September, Confederate General Leonidas Polk violated Kentucky's neutrality by ordering Brigadier General Pillow to occupy the town of Columbus. This was no small act. Confederate forces effectively invaded Kentucky, turning the state into a front line in the western theater of the war. Grant, newly assigned to command in Cairo, Illinois, received news of the Confederate move into Kentucky with urgency. On the same day, Columbus fell to the rebels. Grant arrived in Cairo and quickly organized a counteraction. With Fremont's blessing, Grant seized the opportunity, gathering two regiments and steaming up the Ohio River to take Paducah, Kentucky, on September 6. This bold move placed Union forces firmly on Kentucky soil, effectively nullifying the state's stance of neutrality. Confederate generals Polk and Pillow attempted to organize a counterattack to retake Paducah, but Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston, newly appointed to lead the Army of Central Kentucky, put a stop to the idea. He recognized that Paducah was lost and instead ordered Polk and Pillow to begin fortifying Columbus to block the Mississippi River. Grant's first headache came from Brigadier General M. Jeff Thompson, a Confederate officer known affectionately or irritably as the Swamp Fox for his elusive tactics. Thompson was no ordinary officer. He was a guerrilla fighter with an extraordinary knack for stirring chaos. Commanding his Missouri State Guard partisans with ease, he used the marshy, swamp-ridden terrain of southeast Missouri to his advantage, moving his men through the soggy, treacherous land undetected. With swamps spanning 5 to 25 miles from the Arkansas border to Cape Girardeau, it was a wild landscape thick with muck and reeds, providing perfect cover for Thompson's hit-and-run raids that harassed Union troops and rattled nerves. Thompson was a fascinating blend of cleverness and buffoonery, with a love of flamboyant speeches and dramatic gestures. Known for poking at the Union in ways that demoralized Northern sympathizers, Thompson was skilled at embarrassing his enemies and providing cover for Confederate troops advancing north. His raids were relentless, disrupting Union supply lines and keeping Fremont on edge. Each time the Union forces thought they'd cornered him, he melted back into the swamps, leaving only his taunting laughter in the wind. With the goal of securing southeast Missouri, Grant turned to Colonel Joseph Plummer, a tough, battle-tested officer who had been wounded at Wilson's Creek in the infamous Ray's Cornfield. Plummer led a detachment of 1,500 soldiers from the 11th Missouri and 20th Illinois regiments into the swampy terrain, consolidating Union control over the area inch by muddy inch. Imagine standing on the front lines of history's greatest battles, feeling the intensity, the fear, and the courage of those who fought to shape the world as we know it. On our channel, Past History Unveiled, we don't just recount history, we bring it to life. Through vivid storytelling and immersive visuals, we take you deep into the heart of each conflict, 
revealing the untold stories, the strategic genius, and the personal sacrifices that changed the course of history. Fremont became convinced that the Confederate leaders, Price, Thompson, and Polk, were plotting to move north and cut Union lines, effectively slicing Missouri off from the rest of the Union. He became obsessed with the idea that they were working in concert, plotting an unholy alliance to capture the Mississippi. Though there was little evidence to suggest a grand Confederate strategy, Fremont's paranoia drove him to action. He saw one solution to thwarting these foes, control the river, beginning with the small, unassuming steamboat landing of. Belmont was more than just a river outpost. It was the key to cutting Confederate supply lines between Columbus and Price's forces in southern Missouri. If Union forces could hold Belmont, they could sever the connection between the Confederates in Kentucky and Missouri. But getting to Belmont would mean a direct confrontation with Polk's entrenched artillery at Columbus and Pillow's troops across the river. With Confederate forces strategically placed, Grant knew he'd have to move quickly and decisively. After receiving word that Hardy and Pillow had abandoned southeast Missouri in September, Grant realized his path was clear. At least for now, the swampy, dense, and treacherous terrain of Missouri was now free of the Confederate forces that could have blocked his advance. But looming across the river were the cannons of Columbus and the restless armies of Price and Polk. Grant was eager to take further action down the river and pressed Fremont to approve a raid against Confederate positions. But Fremont, overwhelmed by political pressures and military missteps, refused. Until he was finally replaced by Major General Henry Halleck after President Lincoln lost faith in Fremont's leadership. With Halleck's arrival, Grant was finally free to take the fight directly to the Confederates. On October 21st, while the Battle of Ball's Bluff was raging in Virginia, Grant tightened the noose around Thompson, forcing him to retreat. Grant's tactics were working. By hemming in Thompson's forces, he deprived the Confederates of a reliable guerrilla force and prevented them from spreading Union forces too thin. As the cool October nights drifted into November, Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant found himself restless, his sights now fixed on a little Confederate encampment across the river from Cairo, Illinois, Camp Johnston at Belmont, Missouri. It was a place he'd heard whispered about, a thorn in the Union side that needed plucking. And if there was one thing Grant knew, it was how to stay calm under pressure something his 3,114 soldiers, a mix of farmers, laborers, and green recruits, had come to trust him for. But calm or not, he was about to march these new soldiers right into the fire, and they all knew it. On the early morning of Wednesday, November 6, 1861, the camps at Cairo and Bird's Point were alive with feverish activity. Soldiers packed their knapsacks, the smell of cooked rations filled the air, and weapons were cleaned, inspected, and cleaned again. It was all part of the ritual, something to distract them from thinking too deeply about the day ahead. Grant's command was divided into two main brigades, one stationed in Cairo, under the command of Brigadier General John A. McClernand, an Illinois man who knew how to work the political ropes and had friends in very high places, and the other brigade, led by Colonel Henry Doherty, headquartered across the river at Bird's Point. McClernand's brigade included some heavy hitters, Colonel Francis B. Fuchs, 30th Illinois, and Colonel John A. Blackjack Logan's 31st Illinois, who strutted to the levee at about 3 p.m. to board the Alex Scott, the largest steamboat Grant had under contract. They were joined by Colonel Napoleon B. Buford's 27th Illinois, which boarded the James Montgomery, and an independent cavalry company under Captain James J. Dollins, which crammed onto either the Rob Roy or the Chancellor. The steamers, bristling with men and ready for action, heaved at their moorings as McClernand sent off a quick telegram to his friend, Major General George B. McClellan, alerting him to the venture. By the late afternoon, Grant's fleet set out from Cairo, steaming across the Mississippi to Bird's Point. There, the rest of Doherty's brigade boarded, and by evening, the river was alive with paddle wheels and shouts, the boats packed with young men eager for the unknown. But then came the delay, hours ticking by until 9 p.m., before the fleet began to inch its way downriver toward their target, a shadowy camp just across from Columbus, where the rebel forces lay waiting. 
In the cold, pre-dawn hours of November 7, 1861, Grant's expeditionary force neared Belmont, Missouri. Around 8 a.m., the first transport tied up along the Missouri shore, about three miles north of Belmont. Grant quickly organized his army. Five infantry regiments spread into line of battle, with Doherty's brigade on the left and McClernand's brigade on the right. As the Cairo brigade deployed, McClernand ordered skirmishers forward, sending companies from each regiment ahead at around 10 a.m. to feel out the enemy's position. The woods were eerily quiet, as if waiting for something to break the silence. Then, faintly in the distance, the Union soldiers heard the beat of drums, the long roll echoing from Camp Johnston. The Confederate defenders knew they were coming. The skirmish line crept forward, senses heightened, while the main body of troops waited restlessly further back along the Bird's Point Road. Then it happened. Captain Schmidt, leading the rightmost platoon of Buford's 27th Illinois, ran smack into a Confederate cavalry detachment, just 100 yards beyond a muddy slough. Shots cracked through the air, and the Union men returned fire, easily scattering the rebel horsemen. Buford, sensing they were close, stiffened his line and sent the remainder of Company A forward. Not satisfied, he ordered his entire regiment across the slough, personally leading them and urging them to keep tight. The soldiers pushed through the trees, muskets ready, encountering small pockets of Confederate infantry who quickly retreated into the thickets. As more Union soldiers pressed forward, the Confederate skirmishers fell back, and by 11 a.m., Grant's men had driven them all the way to their main line of battle. What started as an orderly retreat for the Confederates quickly dissolved into a panicked rout as Union artillery opened up on their fleeing ranks. Around 2.30 p.m., the Confederate defenders abandoned their colors and artillery, scrambling toward the river in a desperate attempt to escape. Grant was at the front, rallying his men with that calm, unflinching presence, urging them forward as they surged into Camp Johnston. But as they reached the rebel encampment, the Union troops got a little too comfortable. In Grant's own words, his soldiers were demoralized by their own victory, and before long, they'd broken ranks and were plundering the camp. Tents were ripped open, supplies rifled through, and anything of value was quickly pocketed. It took Grant and his officers several tense minutes to restore order barking orders to corral the men back into line. He then gave the command to burn the camp, reducing it to ash, to deny the Confederates any advantage. What the Union soldiers didn't realize, though, was that in the chaos of the looting and burning, several wounded Confederates were still trapped within the tents. The fire consumed them, an unintentional tragedy that sent shockwaves through the retreating Confederates who believed this was a deliberate act of cruelty. By 3.30 p.m., Union troops began their march back to the transports, taking with them two captured cannons and a number of Confederate prisoners. But just as they neared the river, they were struck by a fresh wave of Confederate reinforcements ferried over from Columbus. The rebel troops, Southerners of the 15th Tennessee, 11th Louisiana, and assorted infantry under General Gideon Pillow and Colonel Benjamin F. Cheatham, surged forward to cut off Grant's escape. Major General Polk, having crossed the river from Columbus, took charge of the Confederate lines, and with Lady Polk, his formidable artillery piece, he ordered a thunderous salvo from Columbus, shells raining down on the retreating Federals. The Union gunboats under Commander Henry Walk leapt into action, engaging the Confederate batteries in Columbus with a fierce exchange of cannon fire. Under this artillery cover, Grant directed his troops to break through the Confederate lines and press toward the transports. But then he remembered something critical. The detachment from the 7th Iowa he'd left to guard the escape route further back. Galloping down the road in search of his men, Grant suddenly spotted Confederate soldiers heading his way. Unknown to him, the 7th Iowa detachment had already fallen back to the transports after learning of the Confederate river crossing. Realizing he was on his own, Grant spun his horse around, racing toward the riverbank, just as the riverboat captains began casting off the mooring lines. In a breathtaking display of horsemanship, Grant rode up to the Bell Memphis, his horse pounding across the gangplank as his men erupted in cheers. Grant was the last man to board, 
and as the boat's wheels churned the muddy Mississippi, the Union transports turned back toward Cairo, the battle behind them. By 5 p.m., the Battle of Belmont was over. Union casualties stood at 607 men, with the Confederates suffering roughly 641 losses. The battle was technically inconclusive, but Grant's force had destroyed Camp Johnston, captured a hundred prisoners, and returned mostly intact. It was a hard-won skirmish that showed Grant's grit and determination. For the Confederates, the burning of their wounded would fuel outrage and resolve in the days to come. But for Grant, Belmont was a critical lesson, a victory tempered by the brutal reality of war and the chaos that victory could bring. It was his first taste of command in battle, and it wouldn't be his last. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more thrilling tales from the American Civil War, where every battlefield, every riverbank, and every hero has a story waiting to be told.